who is an architect and an urban conservationist. She received an honorary doctorate from Smith College in 2012, where she also completed her MA in 1973. She specializes in master planning and building design, and her work encompasses rebuilding and at times reinventing corporate, industrial, and institutional campuses. She received the UNESCO Asia Pacific Heritage Award in 2004 for her restoration of St. Thomas Cathedral, Mumbai, and the Indian Institute of Architects Bagura Mahatre Gold Medal for life achievement in 2014. In 2015, she was honored as Distinguished Professor by the Indian <coughs> Education Society's College of Architecture in Mumbai. Today, Brinda will take us through her journey, what she calls building stories, an architect's journey through the Indian landscape. To quote her, whether it involves the restoration of a rural Indian village, the creation of a corporate campus, the rejuvenation of city monuments, or the establishment of an academic institution, a, a practice has been successfully created that covers the many faces of the Indian landscape. Vinda's reputation has been built on a unique ability to find the appropriate way to build forms that belong. An overview of some of her completed works show each project having its own original and unique architectural interpretation. This clarity of vision will be presented to a journey through four decades of practice. Before I invite Vinda to take us all through her journey, through this fabulous journey, which I am very excited about. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our upcoming programs, which you will notice is rather varied, so it'll, it gives you a flavor of all that we are doing in the center these days. We are beginning a, what we call a defogging series on political theory with a eight-part short course on post-colonial theory which begins on the 6th of October. The details, I don't want to go through all the details of the dates, so you can either look it up on our, on our website or we could, we could give it to you specifically before you leave. The course is a foundational course for post-colonial theory and will be conducted by Rohit Goyal, who has been appointed academic director of the Anthropology. Then on 16th of October, we have India's foremost numismatist, who is with Ashford and Lucin. And uh, one area, one part of our history, which is again very foggy, is the, is the era of the Huns. Who were the Huns? When did they come? What was the connection with other parts of what we call the Northwestern, the Northwestern areas of, uh, of Asia, and not Asia, sub, the subcontinent. And what, where did they come from? What were, what were their religious practices? So Shailendra Bhandari, who has been working on this, has been persuaded to share his current work, which is of course an ongoing research on what he calls religious movements in the Indo-Iranian borderlands from 400 to 700 CE, evidence from the Huna and related colleges. So this is uh, on the 16th and then uh, well, another of our initiatives is what we like to call Western aesthetics. We've been doing Indian, we've been doing Islamic, we've been doing Southeast Asian, Latin American, and Middle Eastern. Well, we're going to be now be fortunate to have two professors coming from New York, from Brooklyn. And uh, one of them is Professor John Van Sickle, who's a professor of classics at Brooklyn College. And he will present a lecture titled uh, the picture poesis, the painter in the poet Derek Walcott. You know, for those of you who are literature students, you know that Derek Walcott is the Nobel Prize winner in literature in the early 90s. So uh, Professor Sickle is going to share his work with, uh, on Walcott and show how Walcott was not only a, a writer but also painted. So what, where are the synergies between his painting and his writing? And then soon after that, we have Gail Levin, who is a professor again from, from, from New York, 
State University of New York. And she's going to be doing a three-day lecture series on 20th century American art, some highlights, which is going to cover the major movements of feminism, of Alex, abstract expressionism, as well as, of course, uh, looking at cinema and Edward Hubbard. So it's uh, the three great movements of American 20th century art, which Gail will be conducting right here. I mean, all of it is right here. So uh, should you be interested, you're very welcome to, to join in. And let uh, us know if, you, if you'd like to come. So now, please welcome, join me in welcoming Brenda Somaya. Good evening. Thank you, Rashmi. And uh, I'd like to thank Yana Kava for inviting me here this evening. Um, I've been in Amma by four. I go on for an hour. Um, I just want to say that um, what I'd like to do today is, is to sort of run, run you through uh, the journey. Uh, people often ask me, not so much in Mumbai, but when we go to smaller places, what really does an architect do? And uh, I thought this might be a nice way to show what I, as an architect, have believed in and done for the last almost four decades. I do believe that architect, architecture truly is the lifeline of history. And uh, without it, I can't even imagine how history would have been able to be put in place, so to say. Its importance is huge. We in architect, uh, we architects in India, we're about 60,000, 70,000 of us, but we're surrounded by people who barely can love people find it hard to even survive. They, in many ways, have eliminated our profession. They don't use us as architects. Uh, they don't feel the need, maybe, in many ways. So what really should be our role in, in our country? India is so complex. It's so multi-layered. Uh, I often say it's like a lacha parata, which <coughs> has so many layers which have to be put together. So what, where do we come in? Where do we belong in all this? Um, to capture India in a, in a single frame is really almost impossible. I think perhaps until the colonial time when um, India's urban areas grew and we had colonial architecture coming. But earlier before that, each area, whether it was the Taj Mahal or whether it was Hampi, each one of these areas developed as a result of the social, cultural, and historical influences around that site. So it wasn't as though there what was the connect between the north and the south, in the east and the west. Today we are Indian architects working in India, but what really is our connection? What really is our reference point? So to me, I think what I have tried to do is, I believe that we can capture India's essence. And that's what, as an architect, I think in some way I have subconsciously tried to do. I've been lucky to work all over our great country, right from the Himalayas up in Gangotri to the deep south, from the east to the west, and right through central India, through the tribal areas in Jharkhand, and right to the big metropolitan areas. So what is it then that, that in some ways I had to create my own vocabulary? I was not privileged enough to have trained under great masters. I graduated from architecture school here, did my masters and came back. And uh, for various personal reasons, started on my own very, very soon. So I didn't have any mentors. I didn't have great masters who taught me or worked with me. So in many ways, I had to develop my own vocabulary. And I think I took it. Uh, I, I, I'm an Indian, so everything. Uh, was connected with that. There was no question of being anyone else. So water, walls, light, geometry, materials, these were some of the, the nouns that I used in my work. 
And these are just some images before I get on to actual projects of my work, where we use water as connectors, uh, as a nucleus in itself, to direct, as a directional element. When it came to light, I don't think no country can have uh, more challenges and more opportunities than we have with our natural light, with shade, with shadow, uh, with direction. And walls, right from Mohenjo-Daro's time, when the walls were built to shade the streets between the houses, walls have played such an important role uh, in Indian architecture. They work to define spaces, they worked as decorative elements, and they worked as protective elements through time. And of course, our wonderful geometry. We have, of course, our sacred geometry. But apart from that, we had the grid, which existed from, again, from Mohenjo-Daro and from Harappa, from the Indus Valley civilization. We have fragmented geometry, axial, uh, the axis working, and so many of our of course, our Hindu, but also Islamic architectural works. So these were all, and finally, materials. Which country can have so many materials? We have all our natural materials, whether it's stone, whether it's wood, whether it's brick, um, right down to the innovative materials that we use today. So these were just some of the elements uh, that I think, looking back, uh, have, have created a thread, perhaps, uh, which has run through my work, which I believe is, is appropriate architecture. Um, there was a, a, a professor from the University of Edinburgh who wrote about my work eight years ago, and it was in an Italian journal, and he mentioned that my work was so appropriate. And I was thinking, what a boring word. He said, appropriate. But now, almost 10 years later, it seems like it's so important that what we build has to be appropriate for the place, for the time, for the people we build for, and not for ourselves. So today I'm going to run through four parts of my work, community, contemporary, culture, and the city. I've divided it because they say you shouldn't talk in more than three topics when you give a talk. There's no way I can do that today. So if at the end you're probably confused, it doesn't matter. It's, it's a long journey, and um, I've chosen a few projects from each one of these areas, which I think reflect in many ways what I've enjoyed so much doing over these years. The community has always been very, very important for me. And one of my first community projects was in 2002. I had a client uh, whom I was doing a lot of industrial work for, and I think we all remember the public day when there was a massive earthquake. And uh, that very evening, this client called me and said, Brenda, we've got to find a village in Kach, which um, needs to be completely rebuilt, because uh, that's what I want to do. So I think we all know there was total devastation over there. Everything, everything had been demolished. And, uh, there was rubble everywhere when I visited uh, this village. We finally realized that a lot of the Hindu villages had been taken by Hindu trust, and a lot of the villages that were primarily Muslim were taken by a lot of Muslim trust. So we had to find a village that didn't fit into either of these. And with the help of Shujan, the NGO, some of you have heard of, we found a, a very nice village called Badli. It had been totally devastated. And but what we did not do was what's in the upper left corner. And the government was doing this. They had done this in Latour as well, where it was too, too much trouble to find out what the villagers really wanted. And they built a grid across in straight lines houses, which nobody shifted to. And I think the, thing, the important thing that was done, and when I say we throughout this talk, I'm not talking about myself, it's not the royal we. Everything in architecture has to be done as a group, with a group of people in a coordinated effort. So we realized that we had to ask the people there what is it they wanted. I think this taught me a very, very important lesson, and I'll come to that later. What we found out that each and every one of them wanted to be back in the same piece of land where they were. It was winter, it was January. They didn't mind sleeping out, even for a year if they had to. 
but they did not want to be taken across the street. They wanted to be back next to their same neighbors in that same piece of land with the same view of what was around. So we took, took a census and then decided that we would build three types of houses. We found out those three sizes and we offered them the choice depending on what size of house they wanted. And it was amazing. For instance, you can see over here that earlier I had taken the roof line up to here and then down. But there are so many superstitions that the ridge line should be in the center of the room. And this is what, this is what taught me that we have clients as architects and we have to ask them and talk to them and find out what is it that they want. So um, we saved all the doors and windows because we had limited funds and how was I going to ensure that there would be an identity for the houses when they came up because we just had three types. We also reused all the rubble uh, for construction and what we did with the client was we the village was very depressed because 95% had been completely demolished and damaged. We had to revive the spirit of the place. So we told the villagers that we would provide material, but you've got to build your village. And we would pay you for the labor. And that's how we created actual uh, uh, work for them. Money was created and we were able to rebuild the village. So these are the actual villagers rebuilding their village. It was very artistic. Uh, we got uh, a lot of paint and uh, organic paint done and you know I don't have to tell you about Kutch and the villages around over there, how artistic. So this is a picture of the houses after it was finished. This is one part of the village. You can see that here. The uh, school was completely demolished. The picture on the left shows you that. The center picture was a map of India. But what was interesting was the teachers came up to us and they said, if we don't find something temporary really fast for the children, they will be sent back to the fields to work. And we will never get them back into school. So please do something for us. So what we did, we just put two water tanks, you can see that. We put a little shed and we got the children back in school. We subsequently built a nice school. A farmer, uh, the earlier school was very small, but a farmer with a contiguous piece of land gave us his land, his farming land, free. And I was able to convince the client that apart from the school, we wanted to have a balwadi, we wanted to have a women's center, and we built an entire school complex, um, which I was very pleased to, to know it won the Fidel Atlas Award for one of the best buildings of the 21st century. It was a tiny little school, so economically built, and the day of the opening, the villagers made their own card uh, showing how they uh, worked on their school and were able to open it. So here are just a couple of images of the school which I'm showing you. Very, very simply built, very economically built. What was important was the four people on the left who we worked <coughs> with. And but for them, we could never have redone, rebuilt this village. Uh, the first gentleman was the one who led us, uh, then there was the Bandini workers. Of course, Chandabai was the, the sarpanch, and she would make me come and sit on her uh, charcoal, and give me some peculiar purplish drink, and I would always be petrified because one thing we scared of is water when we travel. And, but she would watch me, you know, I couldn't even sort of pour it down the side. And with raw mangoes and peanuts, that's what we used to get sitting over there and discussing. And then there was Mr. Patel who believed in, uh, you know, the water turned saline after an earthquake. So we had to create a reservoir for fresh water. Uh, he planted trees. The villagers won many, many awards <coughs> after that. And we went back, and people go back uh, quite often in 2006, 2009. So the most appropriate solutions are brought about by the least authoritarian approach. And the professional has to become a catalyst in the development process. Oh, before I forget, this is a picture of Merzabi uh, when, when we had the earthquake and uh, they were all sleeping out in the open. When I went back after a few years, she had started going to the, the school. And when some of my people went back in 2009, she had gone to the next village, to the high school over there. Another community project uh, was for voice. Uh, 
you know, there are a lot of families uh, who come to Mumbai who are very poor and they leave the, the girl child in the railway stations. So they're not really orphans, but they're alone. And Voice uh, is an NGO who got a small piece of land in Versailles to build a residential small home for the girl child and where they would educate her as well as um, uh, they could stay over there. And this is what we did. It was a privilege for us. We had classrooms, dormitories, a cafeteria, and a library, and little offices. So as you can see, it was a very simple plan, but we created courtyards, corridors, and this is the ground floor plan. It was a similar first floor plan, a long piece of land. And uh, we just created terraces where the children could play, courtyards where they could run around. We used all local materials. The children had to belong to these buildings. They had to be comfortable. I think one thing is very important. When you build, who do you build for? They have to be comfortable in what you build for them. You're not building to be published in a magazine. You're building for the user of that particular building. For me, it was very important that these children should love their building and they should enjoy it very much uh, being part of this. So you can see them in the classrooms and we had to use every nook and corner, every inch of space. So even below the staircase, we had put the sewing machines where the slightly older girls uh, could, could learn to stitch and sew. They make paper, uh, they create invitations for weddings, and all sorts of things are being done over there. Sanitation was important. We tried to upgrade how uh, we could.